Good evening. Uh, my name is Saif, and uh, I'll be introducing the uh, participant this time. This is our last session, um, and then I guess we'll head to dinner afterwards for those who are hungry. Um, the title of this session is The External Involvement in Arab Uprisings. Uh, and I'm sure uh, a lot of Arabs would agree that there is a lot of involvement, external involvement. The region has always been a site of conflict and a site of struggle. Um, we will hear uh, three papers tonight. One um, from Lebanon. Four. Okay, four. Um, <coughs> Well, I'm not going to read the biographies of our speakers, so we have them to save the time. Um, each one will get uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, we'll start with uh, Tamiras Fakhouri from uh, the Lebanese American University. Um. Hello, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today on the possible linkages between migration and politics in the Arab uprisings. Um, my presentation is going to tackle the participation of Arab immigrant communities in the recent political transition. I will be drawing on one paradigmatic case study, the case of Egyptian communities in the United States. So there is consensus that the Arab uprisings have brought a new set of actors to the fore. Still, one category of actors of actors whose role in protest dynamics has not been investigated as that of Arab expatriate communities. We know little about the ways in which Arab communities around the world have used their stay abroad to mobilize against their authoritarian homelands. The diffusion of protests uh, through, the Arab, through various Arab states provides an exceptional terrain for filling in such gaps. So the questions that face us are, how can we conceptualize their engagement in the transitions? And did their engagement from abroad have any purchase on the homeland's political sphere? The reasons why we encounter so many analytical hurdles in such a research field is that we do not dispose of um, sufficient cross-comparative migration data for establishing a global context for Arab world diasporas. Also, we do not have enough insights into the historicity of Arab immigration and its interplay uh, with homeland's politics. Although Arab, um, Arab expatriates were not considered in mainstream democratization studies as effective challengers of um, authoritarianism. And this is something we can discuss later. So to gather some preliminary insights, I drew on the specific juncture of the 2011 Egyptian uprising, and I mapped the transnational practices in which Egyptians in the US engaged to sustain a scope of political interaction with their homeland. One of the aims of my research was actually to show how this method of research holds broader implications for studying Arab immigrant communities and the politics of dissent. I study the involvement of Egyptian expatriate communities in their homelands through the conceptual lens of transnational social fields. Transnational social fields um, are defined by Levitt and Glickschiller as interlocking networks of social relationships through which ideas, practices, and resources are exchanged across borders. This research strategy allowed me to concentrate on the type of linkages that locals and expatriates build beyond the issue of territoriality and beyond nas nationally bound definitions of citizenship and politics. It also enabled me to shift my attention from demographic stocks and flows, which are problematic in the Arab world, and to concentrate on what we call the in-between places. Uh, first, it's worth establishing why uh, the Egyptian case is a paradigmatic case for studying Arab political transnationalism. Maybe two points are worth highli highlighting very briefly. The centrality of the Egyptian case in the 2011 Arab protests and the evidence of prior intersections between local and transnational Egyptian networks. The 18-day uh, Egyptian uprising 2011 has occupied a central place in the body of literature on the post-2011 transformations. We all know that events there have accelerated the diffusion or the snowball effects uh, to other Arab countries. And Tahrir Square stands out as a main frame in the global repertoires of popular uprisings, including the Occupy movement in the US. Uh, moreover, Egypt's 2011 uprising was no accidental outburst of political outrage. It is rooted in prior networks of dissent, and transnational immigrant activity, though limited, has been detected. So Egyptians' engagement in their homeland as politics from the US is nothing new. 
And we all know that the Coptic diasporic community has a long-standing involvement in Egypt. It has been um, categorized as the digital diaspora. Egyptian-American groups have seized also several moments prior to the 2011 uprising to express their disapproval of the authoritarian regime. The 2011 uprising is yet credited with the creation of a platform for sustaining this involvement. At the same time, however, it's not uh, easy uh, to analyze the scope of Egyptian political transnationalism. Um, the majority of Western-bound Egyptian communities can be found in the U.S., as we know. There are varying estimates which put the figure of Egyptians in the U.S. Uh, from 200,000 to more than 800,000. So um, the, the statistical problem is really evident. Although Egyptian communities in the U.S. tend to be more mobilized than in other regions, they are viewed as politically fragmented. Before the 2011 uprising, one could, broadly speaking, categorize them in three dominant groups, Mubarak regime sympathizers, secular-leaning pro-democrats in favor of dismantling the authoritarian regimes, and Muslim Brotherhood sympathizers. So what I did is that I carried out, um, um, in the last month, fieldwork in the U.S., and my aim was to detect how various Egyptian actors, such as academicians, professionals, and activists, participated in the Egyptian protests, either digitally or on the ground. What I found out is that the, uh, their important transnational practices are embedded within three types of social fields, associational, epistemic, and digital. And I'm going to explain. In these three types, what I did is that I mapped out the forms of political transnationality during and directly after the 2011 uprising. Uh, it's very important for me to add that when I did so, I adopted a conception of the political that is not restricted to the exercise of authority by uh, policy-making spheres, but one that trickles down to a continuum of economic, civil society, and epistemic actors and networks. So my findings capture broad patterns of transnational practices and do not claim to be exhaustive. The most significant transnational social field that I detected revolves around initiatives of a civic and associational nature. So directly after Mubarak's fall, Egyptians in the U.S. set up organizations seeking to participate in Egypt's post-2011 governance. Such initiatives that have multiplied post-2011 seek to mobilize cross-border resources such as financial funds and no knowledge transfers. They can be um, categorized into two overarching types, those of a non-formalized nature, i.e. social movements, and organizations that seek to achieve higher degrees of institutionalization. An emerging phenomenon that is really striking is the extension of social movements from Egypt to the USA whereby Egyptians here have assumed over the last two years more political agency. Illustrative cases are, of course, the transnationalization of the al baradai movement, represented through the, the Egyptian Association for Change and the April 6 movement. Such movements served as platforms of solidarity, information dissemination, and they were also active in collecting expatriate suggestions for the <coughs> constitutional drafting process in Egypt and in the campaign for external voting rights. In addition to social movements, we note organizations that seek more institutionalized forms of activism. Within these organizations, there is a growing awareness that participating in local democratization efforts in Egypt first requires improved access to the U.S. political system. Thus, they're pushing for stronger institutionalized presence of Egyptian-American interests here. An additional field of interaction that has gained ground is the transnationalization of epistemic communities between the U.S. and Egypt. So very briefly, epistemic communities are networks of knowledge-based experts, including scientists and academics, who exchange ideas and resources. My field work reveals that exchanges within these communities have intensified since 2011. Such communities can be informal discussion pl platforms, but others have more entrenched legacy, and some have even upheld a policy reform agenda since the early 2000s. One important case that I came across is the March 9 movement, which is set up by a group of Egyptian academics in Egypt in 2004. It aims to free academic um, life in Egypt from security and politicization networks. And it has, been, it has gone transnational as early as 2004 and has ever since been tapping into networks of academics based in the U.S. and in other Western countries. Such exchanges have become uh, very uh, more intense since 2011. I was struck that many of my respondents argued that um, 
After the 2011 uprising, they felt more ownership over local politics because the conflation between politics and territoriality has loosened. Non-territorial epistemic networks have suddenly uh, you know, acquired meaning. So for them, it was a credible avenue to start to deliberate on what is political and what is citizenship and what is democracy. Uh, the third field of transnationality is the broadest one. Of course, we cannot um, um, mm, not talk about it, and it is the digital field. Much has been written on the information technology in the Egyptian uprising, but little work has been done on how this impacted the potential for transnational activism and why it is important for Arab immigrant activism. We all know that through virtual domains of encounter, Egyptian communities in the US and their counterparts in the homeland co-organized direct action, exchanged information that helped build the uprising's uh, momentum. Yet such digital forms of connectivity fulfilled other important functions. According to my research, they provided platforms to integrate transnational subjects in debates on ways to engage into political governance processes and expand Egypt's politics of democratization. So my analysis of social media posts and writings revealed that social movements and associations in the US had an interest in addressing a transnational Egyptian community. There was a debate on citizenship in Egypt beyond territoriality, and this is what one of my respondents stresses. One additional understudy function of the transnational digital field is how local Egyptians and Egyptians in, in the US used it as a vector to escape the homeland's rep uh, repressive apparatus. So many of my respondents were keen on describing the ways expatriates in the US were able to sustain contention when Egyptian authorities disabled the internet for five days starting on January uh, 28. Of course, this example of circumventing the crackdown on social media has deeper implications, which are still under-researched. And what do I mean by this? Arab immigrants who lived in Western states, such as Europe and the US, had earlier internet connectivity than in most Arab countries. And due to this earlier internet access, it is thought that they, they were the key players in what, we in what we call curating the Arab blogosphere and in circulating political activism from a distance. Still little do we know on their electronic repertoire of contention. So the uprisings provide us really with an opportunity to retrace <coughs> how political immigrant transnationalism can be embedded in digital fields. So I will come now to my findings. The significance of my findings is threefold, and we can discuss it later on. Transnational social fields intensified around the juncture of the 2011 uprising, that's true, but most have roots in earlier periods of time. So there is a legacy to rediscover. Such linkages provide an entry point to retracing prior tra trajectories of transnational encounters between the homeland and the hostland. Second, these fields of interaction have richer implications than we would in initially think. In protest dynamics, they fulfill, uh, they fulfill functions that can be better conceptualized within the literature on transnational activism. I would like to allude here to Sidney Tarot's analytical framework of externalization in his book on transnational contention, activism, excuse me, which helps identify why locals and expatriates become collaborators in the politics of contention. So US-based movements and organizations certainly played a role in shifting the scale of contention uh, beyond Egypt's territory and are thus key actors in coordinating contention. Two main implications for these transnational social fields are worth highlighting. First, they contribute to deterritorializing debates on political change in Egypt. And second, they play a role in widening the art understanding of Egypt's uh, politics of democratization. Uh, we still have to discover uh, methodologies to see whether, for example, um, mm, gauging Egyptian expatriates' perceptions of the constitutional drafting process, sending them back home, drafting parallel visions of Egypt's constitution, monitoring human rights abuses and reporting them abroad, you know, count when it comes to breeding more civic engagement or increasing support for democratic principles in the homeland. We do not have exact methodologies to assess uh, such indicators uh, in the literature on democratic transitions. My third finding is, of course, the most uh, very pessimistic because such domains of encounter remain by and large fluid and divergent and are insufficiently institutionalized. And most importantly, they are contingent on uh, national contexts. So the campaign for external voting rights illustrates the sharp break between transnational mobilization and national structures. And I'm going to talk about it just in the two minutes that remain. 
So the voting rights campaign inspired high levels of mobilization among Egyptians in the US. Yet it's not possible to attribute any causality between their role in uh, and the Egyptian government's decision to extend this right. Uh, the political res reason behind this decision in the homeland are crucial. Also, one needs to look at the reasons behind why certain destination countries, which in the past were reluctant to accommodate the devising of electoral districts within their territory, and I'm now, I'm of course referring to the Gulf states here, have accepted to do so and to, uh, in the um, last years. So here I come to my conclusion. Although my presentation looked only at the Egypt as a paradigmatic case, there is future research to be done on mapping, the mapping out the broader transnational social field in other Arab countries. Why should this task be attempted? Recent comparative research has shown a positive correlation between significant emigration trends in certain countries and their political development. By this line of thought, it is thought uh, we, we think that if emigration from the Arab world is sufficiently large, it's going to work against authoritarian regimes. Empirically speaking, Arab immigration rates are twice as high as, global, as the global average. Yet there is insufficient data for us to analyze whether there are any cumulative uh, um, linkages between emigration and political development. And this is uh, actually the motivating factor why I'm undergoing, I'm um, analyzing the linkages between migration and political development to try to um, answer two questions. Have transnational activities of dissent had any tangible effect on the erosion of authoritarianism, redefining authoritarianism, redefining <laughs> politics, and has the interaction between immigrants and local spheres shaped contentious politics in the Arab world, both now and historically? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Hugh Roberts from Tufts University. He'll be talking about Europe. Yes. to thank uh, Richard Norton and, uh, and uh, Professor Hanif Aris for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, <coughs> I've been induced to stray rather a long way from my area of <coughs> expertise, so I make no claim of authority for what I'm about to say. Um, I'm not a specialist on Europe, um, but I occasionally notice Europe when thinking or, uh, or trying to think about Algeria and Egypt, <coughs> uh, when European policy uh, uh, obtrudes into the situation and interferes with uh, what otherwise would be the political logic of what's going on. Um, so, uh, a few, really a few impressions and, and disjointed remarks with the idea to encourage others to discuss this question, uh, because I'd very much like to hear what other people's impressions have been of European policy. Um, I formed a provisional view of um, Western policy in general and European policy in particular in relation to the Arab, whatever we want to call it, as early as late February 2011, when I was a speaker, I was invited to a one-day conference in Paris at the French Institute of International Relations, IFRI, on the curious theme of France's Arab policy, uh, which when I came to speak on this, I had to explain I could only speak of it in the past tense, uh, a remark that didn't go down very well with the organizers. Um, <laughs> But uh, I meant what I said, and I was asked from the floor in the dis subsequent discussion what I thought uh, uh, European countries would do to the, the uh, uprisings in the Arab world, and I said that my fear was that they would be confiscated using uh, a gallicism. The term confisque is a frequent term used in French discussion, particularly of uh, Algerian history, but can be used more broadly. In other words, that the thing would be taken over by uh, forces and interests external to the movement itself. And that actually is an important part of my view of what Western policy has done and has sought to do, has been successful in doing, but of course isn't the whole story. One can't reduce the story of the last three years to uh, a process of confiscation. Uh, confiscations may be temporary. Uh, they may be successfully resisted or, or um, uh, countered in some way. But I certainly think that that has been a central element of Western policy. Uh, and one element of this uh, confiscation process occurred at the, element, at the level of definitions because the power to define a situation is indicative of who actually holds power in that situation. And I was, uh, it seemed to me that the uh, way of defining what was at issue in the Arab uprisings that was uh, an articulation of the Arab actors themselves was to stress the, uh, the content of Bouazizi's gesture in Tunisia and the gesture of subsequent uh, 
Arab, Tunisian, Egyptian, and so on uh, uh, actors, demonstrators. Uh, uh, a revolt against humiliation, against con the contempt the, with which they're treated by the powers that be in their countries, a demand, therefore, that we can, in a sense, we can develop that gesture into an implicit demand, if not an explicit demand, for dignity. Uh, and that c should or c certainly can set in train uh, uh, a fairly straightforward uh, chain of thought that what that actually means and requires is, uh, con uh, can be further parlayed into a demand for citizenship, which implies the rule of law, the government bound by law, the end of arbitrary rule, the end of abuses of power, uh, and that in turn could be said to imply the demand for representative government of some kind, uh, and so forth. Now that was a, a view of the uh, Arab events that uh, I certainly was very sympathetic to. And it seems to me that one of the things that happened was that that got displaced by a different conception of what was at issue, namely regime change, uh, which actually meant, in fact, autocrat ejection. It didn't necessarily mean any further change than that. It meant getting rid of Ben Ali, getting rid of uh, Mubarak, getting rid of Qaddafi, getting rid of Assad, and so on. And it seemed to me that that has very much reflected the process of confiscation that has been essayed, attempted, to some extent affected by external players, and particularly the Western powers. Um, and... Um, this, uh, the point being that the argument for, uh, getting, for concentrating on ejecting the autocrat uh, is either presented as the precondition of everything else, this is certainly how it, pres it was presented in the case of the Libyan story, uh, Gaddafi has to go first and then other things will become possible, the possible dangers in that uh, scenario were, were ignored, or presented as in fact an end in itself. Uh, as, a, as a surrogate for any more substantial regime change such as would imply the advent of a citizenship that means something uh, and would address the kinds of concerns uh, that uh, were in the origin of the uprising. <coughs> Can we distinguish a European from a broader Western role in this respect? Let me just make a few remarks about elements of uh, European responses to the various moments in the, in the unfolding drama. Um, I don't know how many people remember that France's initial response to the events in Tunisia <laughs> was to offer Ben Ali French savoir-faire uh, in the matter of repression. We know how to repress mobs. Uh, let us show you how it's done. This was actually the initial French government response. I think the minister who was, uh, had to take responsibility for that, Michel Alliot-Marie, was subsequently made to walk the plank uh, when the policy... Uh, it was realized that the policy had to change. The subsequent response, of course, was the response of adjusting to uh, the facts that were, if not accomplished, at any rate being in the process of being accomplished by these risings. They were more serious than people anticipated. Policy had to adjust to them. And I think that's where we began to move into the, what I consider to be the confiscation uh, um, plan or approach. If we look at subsequent developments on Tunisia, I'm struck by several things. Let me just throw them out as, as, as impressions. One, very limited European support to the fledgling Tunisian uh, post-revolutionary uh, political, uh, political uh, situation, the very little support to the authorities in the matter of helping them with their acute economic difficulties. Number two, complete indifference to Tunisia's, uh, to the danger to Tunisia uh, of uh, the, the creation of a protracted power vacuum next door in Libya. It seems to me that the Tunisia's interest, the interest of a fledgling democracy, and the only fledgling democracy <laughs> in North Africa, uh, in a different way of handling the Libyan crisis, completely ignored. That's my impression. If others uh, know, know better, I'd like to hear from them. Um, more recently, uh, my impression is that, uh, that France, as the principal European player in relation to Tunisia, has been an important source of support for the most conservative element in the political spectrum, Nida Tunis. But I may be misreading things. People may know more about it than that. But, but Nida Tunis is a kind of reception. It's a complicated thing, and I don't pretend to uh, have a complete analysis of it. I've been rather preoccupied with Egypt. Um, but uh, it seems to me to be the political party, political movement, that is the principal re receptacle for elements of the old regime. Uh, I'm inclined to take the view that room should be made for the elements of the old regime, uh, as long as they don't themselves have... Uh, criminal charges to face, uh, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think that France is uh, a kind of continuing to want to exert influence uh, in a way that may not necessarily be at all helpful. On Libya, 
I wonder if you remember that the uh, initial response, once uh, the talk became after February the 21st, 2011, when the story went around the world that the Gaddafi was using his air force to slaughter peaceful demonstrators, a story that was completely untrue, completely untrue, but believed virtually everywhere, um, that uh, from that point onwards, uh, whether there should be a no-fly zone was the big issue in Western discussion. You may, uh, some of you may remember that in fact Catherine Ashton, Lady Ashton, the, uh, the head of the uh, European Union's uh, foreign policy uh, set up, uh, poo pooed the idea, as did initially the Secretary General of NATO. They subsequently are forced to change their position. Uh, we may, I should also remember that Germany was very hostile to any idea of a NATO intervention or a no fly zone. Um, the German foreign minister at that juncture in 2011, really rather playing the Dominique de Villepin role played by the, the man himself in 2002. Uh, or was it 2003, beginning uh, just before the uh, Iraq war? Um, so evidence of s European reluctance to get involved in what subsequently became the policy. Um, I, as I read it at that time, Britain was already very clearly exuding hostility to the Gaddafi regime and was interested in intervening, which is, of course, really Britain's default position in most parts of the world, it seems to me, that uh, if Britain can intervene, it jolly well will. Um, and we subsequently had France uh, taking a very important role and innovating in international relations. As I understand it, it was an innovation when France actually decides to recognize the new rebel movement such as it was, I think it was then known as the TNC, the Transitional National Council, as the sole repository of legitimacy in Libya. A decision taken by President Sarkozy and according to my informants in Paris, taken without the knowledge of his uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was out of the country at the time. I don't know whether that's true or just uh, that very French thing, a canard, but uh, <laughs> and, um, there's evidence, uh, if the story is true, we're seeing several different layers to the same incident, including an inter-Gaullist, uh, inter-government um, uh, faction fight going on there uh, at the expense of um, conventions in international relations and arguably the long-term interest of the Libyans, but anyway. Uh, what we then get, of course, as you know, is the uh, uh, Security Council Resolution uh, 1973 interpreted to authorize uh, NATO intervention, um, uh, which clearly had as the purpose from the beginning, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I've published my views on this, I haven't seen anyone refute them. The, the object, however, whether declared or not, was regime change, was get, uh, overthrowing Gaddafi. Uh, and um, you may recall also, and that of course is the most palpable kind of external intervention. And I think if anybody thinks that uh, the rebel, the Libyan rebels could have overthrown Gaddafi on their own, uh, all I can say is we inhabit different planets. Uh, I think it's quite clear that that would not have happened uh, and that Gaddafi was overthrown by Western powers intervening through NATO. Um, you may recall also that um, accompanying these developments was the setting up of, I, I forget the, the slogan, the, the, the terminology used, was it the Libyan Contact Group or the Friends of Libya, something like that, uh, an idea subsequently reproduced in the Syrian situation, um, where a, a, a group of external powers, um, chaired by Britain or France, but bringing in Gulf countries as well, would meet at regular intervals outside, of course, Libya, to decide what was to be done with Libya. Now this was just continuing and very much up front and in our faces, external intervention essentially dominating the situation. Now, one aspect of this seems to me to be the extent to which those people who uh, uh, took a different view, and I think uh, after all, Lady Ashton isn't uh, n'importe qui, uh, were expressing a kind of European reluctance to get involved, possibly rooted in a different conception of Europe's interests, uh, which, whatever, however one conceptualizes that, gets overridden by a different view in which it seems to me very clearly uh, that it was Britain and France that were the key players and that they were in effect strong-arming uh, the European Union, uh, co-opting Italy in the process. Uh, and Italy was, uh, it seems to me, uh, had mixed feelings about this and uh, regretted being co-opted later. There's a question whether or not uh, the Britain and France didn't actually strong-arm the United States a little. But that, of course, is I'm going beyond my brief there. Uh, maybe that's something that uh, uh, Pelletro can address. Because <laughs> I saw the United States as reluctant to get involved, <laughs> but eventually finding itself sort of pressured and forced into getting involved. And I think that was a great pity. Anyway, on Egypt, of course, Europe's role has been completely eclipsed 
by the US, which is the, the, the main external player. Um, I'm struck, though, that when what I regard as an extremely important uh, turn of events in June 2012 occurred, not the election itself, but the, uh, the, um <coughs> uh, the uh, invalidation of the legislative election results, followed by the staff's decree dissolving the People's Assembly, uh, something which uh, I regarded, and I know many people in Cairo regarded, as a military coup, as a coup against a democratically elected institution. I'm struck by how little uh, notice was taken of this in Europe, that uh, there, was, there didn't seem to be any real reflex of condemning this as uh, uh, an assault uh, on democratic principles. Uh, I'm also struck that in what was, it seems to me, one of the key uh, issues in the last round of the story, the Morse's, uh, last, uh, Morse's year in office, a key issue was the, the economic issue and the question of raising loans uh, and the failure to get an agreement with the IMF, whereas an agreement was reached with the IMF in Tunisia. Uh, I'm very struck by how little support there was from Europe to Egypt in trying to secure uh, an IMF loan on terms that would have been politically acceptable, because a big problem with the IMF loan uh, terms was that they were utterly unacceptable to President Morsi, as I understand it. Uh, and the point is that, uh, as I see, I think that's an important consideration, because the failure to secure the IMF loan, of course, meant that the uh, case was made for that element of the power structure that was looking to the Gulf, looking to Saudi Arabia in particular. And of course, there's no such thing as a free 12 billion loan. I mean, there are strings. And of course, uh, I think it's reasonable to infer that one of the conditions of the Saudis in making that loan was that something was done about the Muslim Brothers. Um, or at any rate, that entered into the political arithmetic. I was struck also that there doesn't seem to have been any effort by European powers or the European Union to do anything to try to forestall the coup of July the 3rd. What we did get was an unsuccessful attempt to broker a, a face-saving um, uh, formula after the event which, uh, and the question arises, was this to, to be taken seriously or was this fear? Um, so that's, there are those elements. Can you tell me how much longer Four I have? Four minutes. Four, is that all? I've, that's not how long I've been speaking for. No, no you've no, been okay. speaking okay. for okay. more. All right, I'll, I'll have to speak even faster then. Um, let's factor in a few other things. One of them is the attitude to the monarchies. The monarchies, of course, have been given a pass on the question of uprisings and reform and so on. There's no interest at all at the level of government, so far as I could see in the events in Bahrain. No question of supporting regime change there. Uh, no question of supporting significant reform there either, as far as I'm aware. Uh, not even much interest in condemning repression. Um, moreover, of course, there was this alliance contracted with Qatar in, uh, in the Libyan campaign. The role of Qatar in uh, participating in the military campaign uh, with uh, Qatari boots on the ground, it's an important feature of the story, something that came out more or, more or less, uh, more, uh, mainly after the event. Uh, we also, of course, more recently have seen um, the, uh, until uh, the US changed its policy, policy position on Syria, uh, it was pretty clear to me that uh, London and Paris, at any rate, were keen on giving every kind of support to the uh, rebellion in Syria, and were therefore, in effect, continuing an alliance with Qatar, which was one of the main supporters of the rebel movement, and also, of course, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, beyond that, we have uh, the uh, interesting development of the Gulf Cooperation Council as something that's no longer confined to the Gulf, the enlargement of its membership to include Jordan and Morocco. Uh, and that is something that I'm sure has uh, uh, enjoyed the support of Britain and France, at least, whether the EU has a formal position, I'm not sure. Um, uh, a further thing to factor in um, is um, the, uh, on a different plane, I, I'm struck by the indifference of, of European political opinion, whether at the level of the EU or at the level of particular national capitals, to the unenviable position of Christian minorities in uh, the Middle East. I, th I was very struck by that in, in initially in the Iraq drama. Uh, subsequently, it's, of course, uh, a feature of the Syrian drama, but it's also been a fe feature of the Egyptian drama. Uh, where was the uh, uh, amplified condemnation in October 2012 of the Egyptian army's massacre of Copts? 
uh, at the Maspero building. I didn't hear it. Maybe others heard it. I didn't hear it. Um, I'm struck by that indifference. Uh, it seems to me there's an element of incoherence in the European position, but I'm just going to throw that out there without justifying it because I don't have enough time. Um, the, uh, and I'm not going to be able to uh, go into the changes that have occurred in Europe that I think explain this state of affairs, but I want to argue that there have been very important changes in Europe over the last, since the end of the Cold War, since the, since the first Iraq war, uh, that have led to a major evolution and indeed a, a major change in the, in the international outlook uh, of uh, the European community, uh, the European Union as it now is, and of both the United Kingdom and France and other countries as well. I think a key moment in this was enlargement because enlargement empowered Germany uh, as a major player in relation to all the new members uh, to the East and Southeast, uh, which was one of the things that prompted France to push very, very hard for what became known as the Barcelona process, subsequently the European neighborhood policy, uh, at reorienting attention to the southern flank in which France could be the primary player, and France was doing this by instrumentalizing the Algerian drama in the early 90s <coughs> uh, as a major argument, uh, and that uh, has been continued under Sarkozy with the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, and that policy which brought, um, uh, that's that policy was something that led to uh, an element of the casus belli between France and Gaddafi's Libya, because Gaddafi refused to come into the UNP, the Union for the Mediterranean, because it broke, it threatened uh, African interests. It was taking the northern tier of African countries into a European-dominated relationship, whereas Gaddafi was interested in developing uh, a coherent African community and African policy, and that was one of the problems that Sarkozy's France had with Gaddafi. Um, the, I'm going to jump here in my last minute. I've got okay. one and a half minutes. I want to talk... Um, uh, about uh, ideological influences. Let me just signal as one of the crucial changes I was mentioning earlier, France's return to NATO. And this is why uh, this links up to my refusal to talk about la politique arabe de la France in the present tense, because for me that was de Gaulle's policy, and it had substance. And one of the crucial things that's happened in France is uh, the complete abandonment of Gaullist, uh, the Gaullist international vision, even by the party <coughs> uh, that uh, pretends to be it's in, uh, the inheritors of Gaullism, that's to say Sarkozy's party, and the election of Sarkozy was, of course, uh, did to Gaullism what the uh, election of Tony Blair did to the Labour Party. Uh, it was the death knell. Um, the ideological influences, let me just bullet points. France, secularism, modernity, political modernity means a secular state. Secularism uh, is indispensable to modernity and therefore to democracy. This is the mindset of so many Arab intellectuals, particularly those of the left, the Algerian left, totally swallowed this stuff, uh, and it seems to me the Egyptians as well, and this is um, uh, the unstated or rarely stated premise uh, of an entire political position which uh, leads to impasse, if not coup d'etat, uh, because of the inability to come to terms with political Islamism. I think this is a problem. It's, it rests on an, a th refusal to examine the actual historical reasons for the development of secularism in France. Uh, and uh, refuses to deal with the fact that the, that the secularism in France is the product of a problem between church and state. And there's no church in Sunni Islam. And uh, so we have a problem, and it's uh, the problem of the unexamined influence of the French model of uh, political modernity. Uh, in Britain, I think there's another influence that I'd just like to flag, and it's the influence of latter-day Britain, not of Britain's own political traditions, which have been largely forgotten, even by the British themselves, so far as I can see. I was very, very struck the extent to which in Britain today, and by Britain, Britain spokesmen abroad, there is a positive attitude to religious uh, actors, religious collective actors. Um, in, uh, the, uh, in the wake of the uh, terrorist bombings in London in, in July 2007, the Home Secretary uh, made a speech saying that it was the responsibility of what he called the faith communities to deal with the problem. The idea of the political parties of the principal actors in, in, in the state has been lost sight of. And uh, an emissary of the Blair government addressing a meeting in Cairo, which I attended a few years ago, uh, also was putting this view that what's really useful and what government should address and deal with are the faith communities. <laughs> uh, this is an extraordinary view that it has nothing to do with the, the British tradition of representing the government in which anybody who reads any of the political philosophers of that tradition will know parties are the crucial actors, not faith groups or, or religious groups. So we have a problem in what Europe is now putting out in its view of democracy. This is where I'm going to end. Give me 10 more seconds. 
uh, in the European Union's uh, discourse on democratization, it doesn't want democracy. It uses democracy to mean whatever it does want. What it wants is transparency, and transparency means the ability to get a more effective purchase on various regimes it's dealing with than it has already. Uh, it wants uh, to use the human rights um, issue as a way of embarrassing them. It's not interested in addressing the fundamental reasons for human rights abuses as a routine feature, and that fundamental reason is the fact that the state is not a state, uh, 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 is not a, uh, a situation where you have government bound by law. And once you start posing the question of government bound by law, you start posing the conditions of realizing that desirable state of affairs, uh, and you start face facing the fact that you cannot have that without an independent judiciary. You cannot have that without an empowered legislature. And one of the things that is really striking, if it's not the mil most striking element of Western democracy promotion discourse, is the complete silence about the question of empowering legislatures. And that's why I came to the conclusion years ago uh, that uh, Western democracy promotion is actually more or less bogus. Uh, the problem is that's all that has been putting out. And Arab intellectuals, in other words, can be forgiven, in, uh, at least, for having not yet developed on, through their own resources an adequate conception of democracy. And that uh, failure is, in, seems to me, one of the premises of what has been going wrong uh, in Egypt and elsewhere, and Europe has its share of responsibility for it. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Robert Pelitro will talk about the U.S. now. Well, I'm delighted that uh, HAFAM has been added to our panel for two reasons. First of all, I'm no longer the last speaker. The last speaker standing between you and a very good dinner. And secondly, I have intended to use my remarks to talk about the U.S. response to what happened in Tunisia, Egypt, and Bahrain. Coincidentally, the three countries where I earlier served as uh, ambassador. But it's very appropriate that uh, we end with a proper focus on uh, the ongoing tragedy on Syria. Few of us looking at the Arab world in early 2011 or late 2010 uh, would have picked 2011 as the year of revolution. And a few of us would have picked these three countries, Tunisia, Egypt, and Bahrain, as the targets, the flashpoints of these revolutions. And a question that we've been asking inside the U.S. government and I think should be asked elsewhere is, uh, why didn't we see it coming? What uh, were our, were our ambassadors asleep on the switch, or were there things that we could not have, uh, could not have foreseen? Uh, were we just too, comfortable, uh, too comfortably lazy in our uh, relationships with, longstanding relationships with friendly uh, monarchs or autotarchs? Our embassies had or should have had adequate uh, information on the economics of the situation, whether it was unemployment or uh, fiscal stress or um, <coughs> other aspects. They should have had a good picture on uh, what the governments were doing to face up to the difficulties they were having, either through the discussions we had with uh, uh, the leaders in the government or through field trips by our embassies. Our ambassadors, however, in 2010 and 2011, I'm sorry to say this, but it's the truth, did not have or utilize uh, regular access with the heads of state that would have permitted us to have better knowledge of the fact that uh, Ben Ali and Mubarak were both sicker than were being put out, uh, what they were putting out at the time. Um, and were, were cutting themselves off more and more from uh, their societies and what was happening in uh, their societies and relying more and more on the rosy picture being presented by their security services. We did not have as good a fix on that as we should have had. In general, so far as I'm aware, 
the reporting elements of the U.S. government today do not yet have the mission or the capability uh, to collect and analyze big data, cloud data, or to develop the kinds of algorithms that would allow us to uh, have a good fix on uh, impending disruptions. NSA does have that capability. Uh, Facebook has it. Amazon has it. Salesforce has it. The reporting elements of the U.S. government do not have it. Embassies could see but had little ability to analyze uh, the effects of global communications on the Arab revolutions, particularly the day-to-day -day events in rural areas. As little as a, a decade ago, it's likely that the Bouazizi self-immolation would have passed virtually unnoticed, if not completely unnoticed, because it was in the dusty rural town of Sidi Bouzid uh, that was uh, outside the focus of, uh, of uh, embassies and of, uh, of news media. But uh, in 2010 and 2011, uh, the self-immolation was captured on a cell phone camera uh, sent to the new media giant Al Jazeera and uh, within a matter of minutes was broadcast around Tunisia and around the Arab world and that became a catalyst for uh, a breakout. Uh, this was the spark. The United States also did not draw any alerting conclusions from the fact that over five million Egyptians in 2011 were on Facebook. Or the mobilizing potential of the rapidly expanding social media throughout the region. So Washington was ill-prepared to have these three seemingly solid friends uh, and pillars of our influence in the Middle East shaken so suddenly and policymakers were confronted with a series of dilemmas on how to respond. Our preference as a nation has long been for democratic practices, public assembly, freedom of expression. And this had to be measured against the long-standing cooperative relations that we had with the despotic regimes. The historical record makes clear from the French Revolution onward, that the overthrow of a monarch or an autocracy is normally followed by a period of instability, whereas uh, immediate interests of a country, whether they be security interests, political interests, or business interests, are best achieved and protected by a period of stability. Uh, <clears throat> So this was a dilemma. Um, moreover, to give free reign to public expressions uh, in the streets of the Arab world in 2011 would almost inevitably increase uh, anti-American sentiment in those, uh, uh, in those countries. Uh, the means with which the United States had in 2011 to uh, react to what was happening were greatly reduced. We had a declining military presence in the region, reduced financial resources, congressional gridlock at home, and a clear priority in American public opinion to address the domestic issues ahead of new international investments or involvement. Tunisia presented a relatively easy case. The dictator had fled. He had no supporters in the United States. American interests were minimal and non-strategic. The closeness of the Bourguiba era had already given way uh, to, to in the face of Tunisia's non-participation in the Gulf War. The withdrawal of a major American company's investment in Tunisia when a member of the Ben Ali entourage demanded 5%, and this became well known in the American business community. And a reduced need for intelligence 
against a Libyan regime that was already in the process of coming in from the cold. A respected elder statement, Beji Kaida Sebsi, was, overrunning the, was overseeing the transition, and the major Islamist movement, Anahda, was pledging inclusion and cooperation with the secular parties. Winning a plurality in the early elections, Anahda chose to share governing power with the two leading secular parties, the United States, could lend political support to this democratizing process, along with very modest financial assistance. And this posture has continued. Disruptions from the Salafist minorities have delayed, but have not, in my view, derailed the general direction of events in Tunisia. Bahrain also was not too difficult, although it presented a very different set of local conditions and American interests. As Shia-led demonstrations erupted, King Hamad and Crown Prince Salman uh, initially took an accommodating stance. But soon the majority of the ruling al-Khalifa clan, fearing a slippery slope, sided with the hardline prime minister and uh, suppression uh, followed. Um, in this, they were supported and aided by the neighbor big brother, Saudi Arabia, uh, that sent both troops and cash to shore up the monarchy. The other five Gulf states, each in its own way, uh, were mindful of Ben Franklin's famous advice. We hang together or we'll hang separately, and did not support the Shia uprising. They supported the regime. Um, the protests in Bahrain were not directed against the United States or the very low visibility Fifth Fleet headquarters presence. The combination of U.S. energy, uh, security, and political interests, including preventing a Shia contagion in the eastern province, uh, favored maintaining the status quo and has led Washington pragmatically to downplay its pro-democracy impulse. The, mo the, the monarchy did not respond to a low-key U.S. offer uh, for mediation, but it has accepted the carefully worded criticisms of its uh, sweeping arrests and trials, and has been slowly carrying out some of the recommendations of the U.S.-led international investigation of its actions while at the same time not surrendering, surrendering its core interests. Egypt, of course, has been the real challenge to U.S. policy. In the decades since the 1970s, Mubarak's Egypt had become a linchpin of U.S. interests in the region, supporting the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, supporting close cooperation on terrorism, and close military cooperation. Uh, <coughs> At the same time, uh, Washington was becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the, uh, uh, the dynastic and um, non-democratic tendencies of the regime in Egypt, especially at a time when the administration of uh, George W. Bush was increasing the priority of promotion of democracy among our foreign policy objectives. As the e Egyptian uprising spread and showed staying power, the United States initially tried to move Mubarak and his advisors in the direction of greater inclusion and greater popular participation, only to find that its ability to influence the direction of events in Egypt was less than it had imagined. Washington tried to compensate for the lack of strong personal relations of prior years. President Obama's personal relationship with Mubarak was far weaker than either Bush 41 or Clinton. The U.S. ambassador had little access, and Hegel and Dempsey found themselves rushing to develop relations of some trust with the generals. Mubarak and a siege mentality 
finally lost the confidence of the Army, which stepped into the transitional role, unprepared as the generals were for broader governing responsibility. When elections produced the Muslim Brotherhood uh, victory and a Brotherhood president in Mohammed Morsi, the United States took the initiative to try to develop a cooperative relationship with the new leaders, but it was hard going. For years, Washington had eschewed any meaningful dialogue with the Brotherhood and basically shared the regime's exclusionary stance. I have a couple of Ill illustrative uh, anecdotes, and I'd love to tell you one anyhow. The other you can read about in uh, my paper. Uh, on a Mubarak visit to Washington, he was having lunch one day with Secretary Christopher on the eighth floor of the State Department. And during the lunch, Christopher asked him uh, to explain his view of this phenomenon of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Well, said Mubarak, and I'm paraphrasing as best my memory can recall, well, said Mubarak, it's an underground movement that about every 10 years comes above the surface. And when it comes, he said, and he raised his fist, and he's a, he's a big man, as you may know, has a huge fist. He raised his fist, and he said, and when it comes, of course, we have to hit them. And he slammed the fist down on the table, and the silverware shook, and the <laughs> glassware shook. And then he seemed to realize what he'd just said. And he added in a softer voice, of course, this time we're hitting them with democracy. <laughs> the Brotherhood, for its part, didn't do a very good job of developing relations with the United States. And here I have another anecdote that I've got to pass over in deference to our, our chairman. Uh, because now, of course, the wheel is turned again in Egypt. And in power, the Muslim Brotherhood alienated the army and many er Egyptians who had originally supported it. It alienated the Gulf Arabs, the West, and the international financial institutions. Rather than reaching out to other forces in the society, it sought at every turn to strengthen its grip and install its own adherence. It paid scant attention to solving the nation's problems. Massive demonstrations in late June and early July, called by some a popular impeachment, led the Army to take over again and arrest Morsi and perhaps displaying its true sentiments, completely remove the Brotherhood from power. And so Egypt today has experienced a complete reset. The United States is not sorry to see the Brotherhood go. It refused to label the takeover a coup, which would have required ending assistance. It made no call for Morsi's restitution or restoration in power, but it did advise inclusion of all major political forces in the transitional government, which seemed to have the major effect of confusing many Egyptians. Was Washington supporting the army or the Brotherhood? After much soul searching, an extraordinary public briefing in early October by four senior U.S. officials uh, has resolved that issue. Uh, most assistance was suspended. And they made its res resumption repeatedly linked to the establishment of an inclusive, democratically elected civilian government based on the rule of law, fundamental freedoms, and an open and, comp and competitive economy. Even a good faith effort by the interim government to draft a new constitution, submit it to a referendum, elect a new parliament in present, president all over the year ahead is unlikely to clear this very high bar. The United States has set a policy 
consistent with its values and quite unassailable at home. Israelis and others may question how supportive it will be for Egypt, and it remains to be seen uh, what it will do toward Egypt's broader relations. Last week, when Secretary Kerry was in Cairo, he was well received, but also told very bluntly by Foreign Minister Fahmy that the Egyptians were in the process of seeking new friends and broader relationships. And we've seen just in the last couple of days that the Russians have returned to Cairo in force with uh, many promises and many blandishments. I don't think we should be too worried about that. In conclusion, though, the United States has shown no transformational impulse toward the various Arab awakenings. It's presented no Marshall Plan. It's made no proposal for heavy involvement. And there's been no strong congressional or public pressure to become more involved. There's growing inf uh, recognition that our influence and our resources are both limited. The President is keeping his distance. The White House prefers to manage and contain the rolling series of uprisings that's likely to continue over the decade ahead. It's adopting a pragmatic and differentiated approach. The current opportunity in Iran is receiving more importance. And in dealing with global issues and Arab world crises as we see them coming up in uh, the years ahead, if they do not directly affect American interests, uh, will likely be responded to by the United States through coalitions rather than through any unilateral action. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Dr. Haytham Manna. It is uh, the intervention of the last moment also because it's not prepared. Uh, but uh, my colleagues were very rich and I think that I, I am uh, easily can complete some ideas and not beginning in the subject. First of all, if we like to speak about foreign uh, intervention, really Libya is in face. And the question of Libya was very clear for all of us in France, first of all. And in France, I, were, I was one of uh, people, Libyan and no Libyan, uh, near than the Libyan embassy. And I asked people not to go on side because it will be a great problem. And uh, when some of them went inside, the police didn't make anything. And I was surprised, as there's nothing. And I went with them inside the embassy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I asked myself what happened. When we did the same thing for the Syrian, they took us about 100 meter uh, up of the embassy. And here we are near the embassy and we can go on inside with papers, with everything, with documents. Really, we asked many things at this moment. Then we know the history and the end of this history. The most important thing to me is two things. If you look to newspapers, TV, and everything for one month after the death of Gaddafi, 
all speak about French victory. The first French victory for more than one century. And etc. It's not only journalists, but also academics and many personality in great responsibility now or ex responsibility. But the other thing which we saw in this example is the role of Qatar. And this change in the role of Qatar. I think that Qatar win a credibility to have more important regional role in this moment because they were really implicated in all sense. They had in Qatar, in Doha, the Libyan TV of the opposition. They have paid many money and they paid also many arms. For that, I think the politic of Qatar will be changed in the regional because of this credibility when in the Libyan example. The second remark is, in the same time, if we look to the chronological data, we have the entry of the Saudi army in Bahrain. And in this moment, I was in Qatar. And I said to Hamad bin Thamer, the director of Al Jazeera, the general director of Al Jazeera, you know we, the regional Cold War began, now began. And I think this is the history after of what we call the intervention in the Syrian crisis. Because the beginning was before, before us in Bahrain and before us in Libya. Some people thought that it is possible to copy the Libyan example. And I think this is the most important mistake which the Syrian people pay the price up to date. And they ask us to change the flag. They ask us many things. Alain Juppé asked to, to copy what happened. And he went out of Quai d'Orsay with the name of Syrian Transitional Council. That's mean the same name of the Libyan one. He never pronounced the name correctly of the Syrian National Council. This is very important lapsus. You know, I am psychotherapist, and I, <laughs> I cannot understand it other way. For Syria, we have two great periods. The first one, what we can call the no coordinated period, and the second, the coordinated one. In the camp of the regime, you have the allies of the regime. All of them in this, this first period. The Russian position was against us from the first reunion of the Human Rights Council. I was there. I met the ambassador, the Russian ambassador, and I said to him, we must do something. And look, there were many things for other countries. Why? responsibility to protect many things. We don't discuss the Syrian question in the same way. He said to me, listen, all of these put it near the new. There will be 20 veto in the Security Council. 20 veto in the Security Council. When I heard that, I went back to Cairo the direction of our national coordination body wa was there, Abdul Aziz Al Khair, now in prison, and Hassan Abdul Azim, on all of them. And I told them the history. They said to me, We are going to see Atiyah. Atiyah, the Minister of State at that time of Qatar for foreign affairs. 
And when they went there, Atiyah said that we are going to the Security Council with Al Arabi, Nabil Al Arabi, the Security uh, Secretary General of uh, the Arab League. The Arab League. They said before going, go to discuss with Russia. Our friend just came from Geneva and he told us that Russia is decided to stop any process in the Security Council. And the answer of Atiyah was, no word, man, we will pay for that. And Abdul Aziz Al Khayyar said to him, Syria is um, more important than all the budget of the country. You must think the Syrian question in other way. And again, the same movement. And I think that in this mo moment, we understood that some people think that it is possible to make everything in Syria. For the other allies, Iran. Iran, from the beginning, we had diplomatic departure of many ambassadors from Damascus, and we have sanctions from the European Union. One month after the sanctions, the Syrian government received about $3 billion from Iran. No, no, from Iran, cash. You know, there is system day. No, no, this uh, <laughs> system of banks is only for some people, not for our region. And in this moment, we understand, all of us, that the allies of the regime are serious. And they are doing what they say. But when we discuss with others, Really, they didn't have any plan or a logic way of how to do in Syria and what we can do in Syria. <coughs> For that, we went in delegations to the countries which were between them. That's mean I went to South Africa to to see the president and minister of foreign affairs, and in India, Brazil, all of these countries, to try to win people to our uh, popular movement. The discussion with Americans and Britain were very short. I met Haig in January, the 1st of January, five days after, 2012. And he said to us, we are ready to unify the Syrian opposition and you can do it yourself. I said to him, it's a very good thing. And we are ready also to, to discuss with her. Because in this moment, we had an agreement with the Syrian National Council and it was stopped by services. And I said to him, I'm ready to go again immediately. He said, our project is to make a kind of friends of Syria and we will find many countries to be inside this. And you can discuss between you before coming to this conference, which may be in the country of your friend, Monsef Marzouk. I said, okay, it's possible, why not? But wait, if you are really, if you want to help the Syrian people, don't put aside Russian and Chinese because it will be a war of access. 
and these people will be against you that's mean with the regime 100 percent and this is in this is not in our interest he said no 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 we have a very good contact with russia i remember that very well and then we went out and they decided that there is only one representative of the Syrian people to stop any negotiation between the parties of the opposition and to take this party to Tunisia. Marzouki refused that and this said, my friends must be here. Because of a long history with between us since 25 years of friendship and working together in human rights. They said they can come, but as observer. That's mean we are observer in the Syrian uh, question. And the Khawaja are member. And I refused that. I was, I was at that this moment in Tunisia, and I refused to go to the conference. Monsef asked me to come, and he asked me what you propose me to say in this conference, and we put together some points. Our three, no. No to sectarism, no to military militarization, and no to foreigner military intervention. And he said it in the conference. But after that, we had two lines that's mean all contact with the country of friends of Syrian people, what we call, become second level. We don't have the right to see any minister. Before, I met myself 12 European minister. But in this moment, when they, they decided who is the representative of the Syrian people, they asked us to go on site or not to be. And they said to us exactly, you will be marginalized, whatever your force in the country. This is an example about the intervention in the internal affair of the Syrian opposition. One minute. One minute. You know, we have what we call the no governmental parties. From the beginning, before Baba Amru, Mu'assasa uh, Eid al-Khairiya, the charity Eid uh, institution, and Abdul Rahman, when is Sahab al-Kuwaiti? Abdul Rahman, Nu'aymi, Waha Walid al-Tabati. So they were all of them in Tripoli, in Lebanon, not to help us in humanitarian help or political, but to the question of army. And we tried to explain to them it will be catastrophic. And they didn't accept to speak with us. And with this, these people, the no governmental Salafit of the Gulf country, the militarization began in the country. Thank you so much. We have uh, about 10 minutes. We can take two questions only. So, um, okay, Gilbert. Uh, I thought you were going to ask. Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, I want to, to express uh, my disagreement with part of what uh, you sa has said, and it won't surprise him. Uh, but uh, first, let me mention the fact that uh, you said uh, no one tried to refute uh, what uh, you, you described as uh, <coughs> the goal being in Libya regime change. Well, I, for one, wrote a very long piece. But you, you have perfectly the right of not having read it, but it was on Jadalia uh, in August 2011. 
uh, uh, discussing in details the conduct of the operations of NATO and statements from NATO governments showing that this obsession that I mentioned in my own talk with the, with the, the lessons of Iraq. And uh, two weeks before the fall of the regime, the Economist, which is not very uh, far from the views of uh, the Cameron, uh, Cameron uh, government, as you know, uh, uh, was the, the editorial of the Economist was explaining why it would be a major mistake if uh, Tripoli uh, were to fall. So I think uh, there are many signs, and uh, you, you can find the whole list in, in that article which was written before the fall uh, and published before uh, the fall uh, of, uh, of Tripoli. What do you mean by regime change? If we mean by regime change, l for instance, the president stepping down, then of course, I mean, they are for regime change. If we mean by regime change the real sense of this formula, which was Iraq, this paradigm is definitely not on the agenda, is no longer part of US policy. On the contrary, you will find much more statements saying we are not for regime change than any statement since the, the, the uprising began saying we are for regime change. The paradigm now is the formula in Washington, which started in 2011, is orderly transition. <laughs> That's the, the paradigm. And that means the Yemen type, the, the other type of solution, that means preserving the state. This is what they call the lesson of Iraq. Preserving the state, but having the president or what whoever <laughs> is, is seen as the, the, the book emissaire, the, 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 the scapegoat, necessary scapegoat for calming the mass movement, step down. That's the perspective. And that's why Washington, if you look at Washington towards Syria, basically Washington is betting on Russia. To Washington is trying to pressure Russia into removing Bashar al-Assad or convincing the regime that Bashar al-Assad should step down. That's basically what they are doing. And this, uh, the, I mean, this way of, of, of relying on Russia, we have seen it very, very clearly also on the chemical weapon and how it, it was through Russia that you had this deal uh, negotiated. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, and let's try to limit it so because we need to take more one more question. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm uh, astonished that you, could should, you should consider that my claim that the object of the exercise of the NATO intervention was regime change in the sense of overthrowing Gaddafi has been refuted. And I'm su surprised that you should consider that an article in The Economist uh, amounts to serious evidence. Uh, what was the object of the exercise? If it wasn't to overthrow Gaddafi, why was Gaddafi's no, office? Sorry, I just said that they wanted Gaddafi to step down, of course. Yes. Yeah, just said that. Ah. But they wanted a deal with the regime without. Uh, Gaddafi without was. The, then, then they were incompetent. Yes. They were incompetent. Yes. To overthrow Gaddafi meant the collapse of the Jalahiriya. And it, 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 you agree. And, and uh, so. Uh, that in, 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 in some registers would be an even graver charge that is to be substituted for the one I'm implicitly making, that uh, nincompoops and incompetence have been running uh, world affairs. Uh, one way, I mean, either way, we are talking about external intervention <laughs> and its uh, deplorable consequences. Um, on your second point, um, I wasn't talking about US policy. I was talking about Europe. Um, and. Um, uh, I'm perfectly uh, glad to see that uh, distinctions are now being made that it seems to me a couple of years ago were not being made as a general rule. Uh, I'm in favor of orderly transitions myself, and this was the, r this was the rationale for the position I took and the International Crisis Group took on Libya in, uh, in the spring of 2011. It wasn't that we wanted Gaddafi to stay. We wanted an orderly transition, and we weren't listened to then. Thank you. Hani? Uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, it's the first time I hear you, and I tell you very frankly, you took my breath away. Um, I was so impressed by your courage and by your analysis. I have hardly ever uh, met uh, many uh, American professors uh, who uh, analyze Middle Eastern studies who have that kind of courage of their beliefs and the ability to uh, penetrate the uh, veneer and go to the basics. But um, to mention two things to you. One, uh, recently in the negotiations on the um, uh, Iranian nuclear uh, program, France played a very dirty role. 
they actually put the sticks in the wheel at the last minute. And it's said that they did that uh, on uh, notice from the Saudis that they will withdraw uh, their, um, uh, their deal for, uh, for um, hardware, military hardware. Uh, do you have any idea about this? Uh, second item on the issue of, uh, of Libya. Um, Berlusconi actually uh, is um, recorded as having said that Sarkozy entered the, uh, the Libyan uh, 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 and, and caused the Libyan uh, problem, uh, war, because France wanted a better economic uh, position in, in Libya, wanted a better uh, um, uh, oil concessions. Uh, he accused him publicly, and it's written. Um, uh, Sarkozy himself, do you, don't, do you think it was only just the economic um, uh, greed? Um, I mean, I noticed that in 2010, we had the Madrid conference, summit conference in, among the Europeans. And a few years be before that, the 12 uh, wise men commission that the European uh, Union had formed, um, uh, led by a wise uh, man, called Madeleine Albright, as you know, came out with a policy on security for Europe for the next decade. And among the recommendation was that European countries should go ahead and proceed if they see a threat and deal with it and Europeans will follow. And France took, uh, took advantage of that. So don't you think that somehow a uh, European continent is setting itself up that its members may get it involved in, in a deep pro uh, trouble? foreign interventions and then they have to follow like Germany and Italy had to follow France and then England um, thank you for your kind words um, um, on the latest thing uh, I'm inclined to agree with you that whatever it may be said for dipl for understandable diplomatic reasons uh, by American government spokesman it does look as if France has put uh, the the les bâtons dans les roues uh, has, has sabotaged this, or at least uh, created an obstacle. Um, why it should have done that, I don't know about the Saudi deal uh, threat uh, <coughs> hypothesis. It seems to me that, that whatever the specific reason, there is a structural, let's, let's uh, uh, I'm following Melanie Kamet's uh, example of going to structure here, something I wasn't able to, didn't have time to say. I think that, that we've got, uh, in European attitudes, two points that intersect. One. The weakness of the European Union, and in particular its own undemocratic character, makes it extremely difficult to identify the, Euro the collective European interest uh, in moments of crisis. Uh, European Parliament is, is does not have the power to do that. And what therefore tends to happen is the particular interest of the most powerful member states can come to the fore and override, particularly where, as in the case of Britain and France over Libya, they formed an axis, let's call it an entente an entente belliqueuse, perhaps. Um, but I think that basically Britain and France were, it wasn't just France. I'm, 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 I'm disinclined, uh, even though I'm British, I'm disinclined to uh, place all the onus uh, of uh, responsibility on Sarkozy, much as I just personally dislike <laughs> Sarkozy. <laughs> uh, I think Britain also, uh, the Cameron government, were actually rather keen to intervene. Um, <coughs> so that's my re reply there. But of course, there's a lot more to be said about both of these stories. Go ahead. We have we have only two minutes, so for the question and the answer. Quick comment. Uh, the uh, the um, I'm just uh, curious about the question and again. The Libyan intervention has been huge, and I think has consequences as far as what happened after that. Uh, this is to f the question for Hugh and also for um, um, uh, Haytham. The, the Gaddafi regime had a very, very good, it's true that they competed in Africa and, and, and they were rivals. Um, that's why probably you know, it explains the celebration in France. I mean, whatever uh, the regime, is, it's, uh, its failure, uh, they were really got rid of a rival in many ways. But they, the regime made peace and they were invited to France. They had contracts, they had uh, interests and they, they, you know, um, with England and uh, there was a, a, a major um, um, kind of um, rapprochement between, between the Gaddafi regime and these, these, um, these two <coughs> uh, European states. 
how could we explain uh, that they really had a, a very, very you know, cooperative um, phase, and then finally, okay, we got an opportunity to get rid of him. The second thing, uh, also, I would like to see uh, to hear more because I didn't follow the French debates as probably you did when you were in France. Uh, I know there's a lot of celebration, uh, which is, I think, related. There are so many people who want to get rid of Gaddafi for different reasons and his regime. And that's probably the thing that was missing in, in, in the debate in Libya. Uh, so if you could comment on that, I'll, I'll, I'll be appreciated. Um, go ahead, and then we'll give you each uh, two minutes for the last intervention. Um, Please go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to react to um, your comment on the EU politics in the Middle East, that it is very surprising that, I mean, there have uh, for the last years, we have been talking about the EU ambivalent role in the Middle East and how it was complicit in sustaining authoritarianism, either through the dossier of the irregular migration or also through this tension between the development and security agendas. So it's really surprising that it took, I mean, scholars um, um, years in order to uh, come to exteriorize, I mean, this ambivalence or to talk about it. And uh, for me, what I would be interested in knowing, how do you think it's possible now that we learn these lessons, I mean, from the 2011 up uprisings, how can we redirect this? I mean, beyond the lessons, because we have been talking about this for the last decade, about this ambivalent role. So what can we do now in order to um, fill in those gaps? Or what do you think should be done when it comes to EU politics in the Middle East? Is there something to be done, or is this like fatalistic? I mean, this discourse on EU ambivalence and its uh, dissonant foreign policy in the Middle East. So I would like to maybe learn a I bit wonder, uh, Ali Abdelatif, uh, Ahmed's question, I wonder if I could actually pass the buck to Bob Pelletro, <laughs> 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 not only to bring him into the discussion, uh, but because I think actually he may have some light to, th to, th to show on, the, to, th to throw on the question you've asked, but I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I know the whole backstory behind France's position. Uh, it's something I would like to investigate. Uh, but you, you, you raised the question of rapprochement. Let me give my 10-second uh, thesis and uh, invite Bob Pelletro to, to pick it up, uh, his version. Uh, I think that um, my view is that it's connected to the need to engage in the confiscation uh, strategy that I talked about at the beginning. That the Arab uh, risings were something that threatened the element of control that Western powers have over this strategic region. They were looking for a way of getting purchase. And I think that in London, where people are capable of turning like a London taxi, doing a 180-degree turn on a sixpence, you know, they were perfectly capable of saying, this is an opportunity. What's just begun in Libya is the opportunity we're waiting for. And there was already a developed military uh, understanding with France. Uh, whatever the particular reasons one may adduce, I think that there is a general strategic reason. But that's just my hypothesis. I can't, I'm not saying that this, I know this for certain. It's my, it's my reading. If I may briefly uh, refer to um, Estameras, yes. is that right? yeah. uh, your yeah. question. Well, I was saying these things a long time yeah. ago about Europe. No, actually, I, I like but, very but much your analysis, but what can we, where but can we go from I was, here? I was, <laughs> I was saying them about uh. Europe and, and France in particular in relation to the Algerian drama. Uh, back in the 90s uh, or uh, early thousands. Um, I think that, <sighs> where can we go? Um, wh who's the we? I mean, I think that there is, there's an issue about what, what the, uh, is the, in a sense the agenda for Arab intelligentsias. Mm. Uh, and uh, I have been a bit depressed, I have to say. Um, uh, I lived in Egypt for quite a long time, and I ended up being really rather depressed. This was mm -hmm. before uh, January the 25th, 2011, but I ended up being pretty depressed about what seemed to be the state of the Egyptian intelligentsia in it terms of its political outlook. Maybe it was a jaundiced view. I wasn't seeing it all. I mourned the passing of several very fine Egyptian intellectuals, Mohammed Said Ahmed, Mohammed Al Said Said, and so on. But it seemed to me that there was a kind of deficit of democratic thought amongst them. And I'm hoping that one of the major silver linings uh, of the events that have been taking place is the, if you like, the intellectual payoff or dividend from the events in Tunisia uh, and elsewhere, because I think that is re-energizing political thinking in the Arab world, but it needs to spread east from Tunis. 
and there is a Mashriqi reluctance to take what comes from the Maghreb too seriously, it seems to me. It seems to me there is a prejudice to be overcome there. That's my answer. Thank and you. France has had a, uh, a much closer view toward uh, North Africa and North Africa's relationship to France mm -hmm. than uh, it has with, uh, with the Mashriq. Mm -hmm. So France had a, uh, I would say, an additional uh, reason to uh, <coughs> want to see the Gaddafi regime fall. And as for, as for Britain, Hugh knows much better than I do that uh, there's a long history of Libyan shenanigans in London that uh, even a, uh, uh, a short period of Libya coming in from the cold uh, was not able to overcome, not able to dispel. Thank you. Um, Dr. Manna, two minutes. I will answer by two things. The first one about uh, a history. Eric Chevalier, the ambassador, actual ambassador and responsible of Syria staff and the Kedorsi, were nominated to re-establish a good relationship with Bashar al-Assad. And he spent a long time. He is the only ambassador to take dinner with uh, Makhlouf. Rami Makhlouf, the only one. Nobody, the banana countries never accepted to take dinner with Rami Makhlouf, but he took many times dinner with Rami Makhlouf to re-establish a good relationship. Now we consider us as moderated and not enough uh, good opposition to put uh, out Bashar Assad. The second example, a dissident general told me that he was invited by Bashar al-Assad to dinner. When he went to the dinner room, there were a great photo of four persons, Asma, his wife, Moza, Hamad bin Khalifa, and Bashar al-Assad, and a little photo of the Assad family in the third month of events in Syria, not before the 18th of March. <coughs> this, you can understand many things with these two examples. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Com no comments. Thank you so much for attending. We promised you to, f to end the conference at 5.35. We end it at 5.35. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone uh, that presented today and participated in the discussion and dialogue for playing such a such an important role and what I think you, uh, at least I found and I hope you agree has been uh, a very very uh, nice uh, uh, nice conference and I'm really happy that all of you who've come to participate and to participate in the audience and so on have have made it so. Uh, frankly, Honey uh, and I worked hard to sort of bake the cake, but you know we didn't know what it was going to taste like. So, it tasted pretty good, and I was very happy to have had a small role in putting it together. Uh, I do want to make just two comments, if I may, about what we've just heard. One is that one can't listen to Hytham without being haunted by the militarization of the conflict in Syria by the opposition. And I remember being sort of uh, profoundly opposed to that step. And some of the material you've shared with us, I think, um, um, underlines the importance of that kind of disquiet with the militarization of, of the struggle. The second thing is that I very much appreciated Ambassador Pelletro's comments this afternoon uh, which were a little bit hard on U.S. diplomats, but he wasn't sufficiently hard on the U.S. academics who inhabit the world inside the Beltway 
and it were captivated by models of creative authoritarians and resilient authoritarian systems that were one step ahead of the opposition, some of these people were the, quote, best minds in Washington, and it was a degree of infection, I think, that went from outside the government to inside the government, thanks to the work of some of my colleagues, unfortunately. So that had, had to be said because it wasn't said today. Uh, but I do want to thank you all very much. Some of you are remaining for dinner, so we've made some transportation arrangements or we can walk down the street, and so we'll talk about that in a few moments. But I do want to thank all of you, remind you that we will have the streaming video up in a few weeks. We'll have some reports up uh, shortly. And also, at the, um, at the invitation of a colleague, Edward Bustan, I wanted to note that uh, for those of you who have a little bit of time, <coughs> There was a screening on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of Algerian-born uh, Albert Camus uh, of the film The Stranger, uh, 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 and that is um, in CAS 430, if you're interested, at 6 p.m. And a great film, and uh, maybe, yep, yeah, tonight at 6 p.m. In fact, the dinner doesn't start until 7, so there's time to catch a good part of it. So. Thank you all very much for coming today and, and for participating. Bye -bye.